It's March 18th, 2018. A young man has just been gunned down behind his house at night. At 22 years old, Stefan Clark lost his life in a deadly confrontation with police officers. Some of you may think it was justified. Others demand immediate justice. But one thing holds true, that this tragedy was the byproduct of both negligence and a purely emotional reaction. Less than a week after the death of Stefan Clark, teachers all across the country began to walk out of their classrooms with picket signs demanding more resources so that no classroom would go without supplies and no child without textbooks. For years, our schools have been underfunded. Our programs run inefficiently. And money siphoned from those who need it the most by those who are corrupt. And only a few states away from where the majority of these demonstrations occurred, we find Flint, Michigan, still without clean, drinkable water. Between 6,000 and 12,000 children with lead in their bloodstream. Four criminal investigations, four lawsuits, and a public health state of emergency. Why? And that's only in the United States. If you journey with me across the Atlantic Ocean to the continent of Africa, toward a nation known as Burundi, we find a place without a health infrastructure where the life expectancy is a mere 57 years old. People are quite literally dying from diseases that are both preventable and treatable. Diseases which should have been spotted and should have been stopped five or 10 years prior to the individual's death. Why? Is this merely nature? Or is this a testament to our own innate fallibility? What I've just told you may seem pessimistic, but what I'm about to offer you is perhaps the most optimistic vision for the future of our species. Think about how you learn. From a young age, you're inundated with what amounts to petabytes of sensory information, data, and soon you're able to draw conclusions from that information. You begin to develop a sense of touch, of taste, of hearing, of sight. And soon, you're able to make predictions about what might happen in the future. You're, about to con you're allowed to conjecture about what may happen next. But the process that I just described to you is not occurring within the mind of a human being, but rather inside a machine a computer sitting atop the desk of a professor, of a PhD student, of a hobbyist. It's what we call machine learning. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, where we recursively introduce data to computers and allow them to break down complex phenomena far beyond our understanding, to learn from what has happened in the past and to make predictions about the future. So journey with me back to March 18th, 2018. Stefan Clark is walking through his neighborhood at night. He comes upon his house and police officers waiting for him. They search him, they bring him to the station, and they question him. And the next day, he's released. It could have happened this way. It should have happened this way. What was different this time? The officers who would be involved in the Stefan Clark shooting were flagged only a week earlier by a computerized system that put them at high risk for being involved in an adverse event. This isn't a theory. This isn't fiction. This is reality. For the past few years, the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department has employed a machine learning algorithm 
to flag police officers who may be at risk for being involved in cases of racial profiling or police brutality. They've been able to use machine learning to compile a comprehensive psychological and professional profile for the police officers using metrics such as how many calls they've responded to, how many times they've drawn their weapon, and other less quantifiable metrics, like the amount of psychological duress they've been placed under. And between 2005 and 2012, this algorithm stopped 48 out of 83 adverse events, 12% higher than any human-based intervention system. Stefan Clark could have been a part of that 12%. If we were to employ machine learning algorithms to police departments all across the nation, Philando Castile, Stefan Clark, Tamir Rice, they could be with us today. Biases can be discovered. More attention can be given to police officers who are under great psychological and emotional trauma, and lives can be saved. It's now a week after March 18th, 2018. No teachers are outside demonstrating. No protests are occurring. No classroom is without supplies, and no child is without a textbook. Why? Because for the past few months, a machine learning algorithm has been managing the financial resources of the cities, of the states. They've been reallocating funds to the programs that need them the most, the programs that return the highest investments, the ones that are run the least efficiently are now being provided with more resources. We see machine learning applied in the financial sector. We see it applied to optimize trades, to minimize loss, and to maximize returns. Why can't we apply those same algorithms to our state's finances? Delaware, a small state in the Mid-Atlantic region, has piloted a program known as Open Checkbook, where the entirety of the state's finances, expenditures, revenue, where the money has gone, what money has been lost, and what gains have been realized, all of that is available for public scrutiny. Why then can't we apply those same machine learning models to look at the historical financial records, see what has worked and what hasn't worked, and make decisions for the future so that no longer are our funds misallocated and no longer are our resources misappropriated? And lastly, I invite you back to Burundi, a nation with a life expectancy no longer under 60, but rather on par with the rest of the industrialized world. How? How is a nation without a health infrastructure able to do such a thing? Well, for the past few months, a machine learning algorithm has been diagnosing diseases. It's been looking at the patterns in the data and scoping out tumors, detecting cardiac defects. This is not fiction. Recently, a 22-year-old student received FDA approval for a machine learning algorithm that takes a three-dimensional look at the heart and within 90 seconds is able to diagnose a myriad of cardiac arrhythmias with a greater accuracy than any cardiologist. We've seen machine learning algorithms applied in oncology, where they're able to discriminate between benign and malignant tumors within the breasts with greater accuracy than actual radio oncologists. We can bring these algorithms, this technology, to nations that are impoverished, the people who need them the most, and we can restore any semblance of peace. We can save millions of lives. Humanity has made mistakes. We've put our own self-interests ahead of the collective good. 
for epics, we have fallen short of what should be expected of us. But now, we are poised for the greatest choice of our existence. And that choice is whether we will accept artificial intelligence or if we will reject it. I ask all of you today not to look at artificial intelligence as your replacement, but rather your enhancement. Not to look at artificial intelligence as your adversary, but rather your savior. Thank you.